The Great War. For the first time in history, major industrial nations are locked in mortal combat. To men facing the awesome power of massed artillery, of gas and of machine guns, the difference between life and death seems little more than chance. Courage and endurance appear to count for nothing. Even acts of great heroism seem somehow anonymous, lost in the sheer scale of the slaughter. By 1915, the contesting armies are immobilized in the stalemate of the trenches. The dash of the cavalry charge is already a thing of the past. To the civilian populations of Europe, hungry for heroes, the trenches have little to offer. Yet, a new form of combat is already taking shape. It will produce the most celebrated heroes of this war and of wars to come. Almost from its beginnings, 
Aerial warfare and the exploits of flyers high above the squalor of the trenches captures the popular imagination. Of the many roles played by those who fight in the air, one will acquire a glamour and status above all others. He is the fighter pilot. The best will become known as aces. Baron Manfred von Richthofen of the German Air Service. By the time the Red Baron is shot down in 1918, he will have won 80 victories. His large formations of Fokker triplanes are so brightly and variously colored that they become known as Richthofen's Flying Circus. Captain Albert Ball of the Royal Flying Corps, a determined individualist who loves to hunt alone. By his death in 1917, Ball would have won 44 victories. James McCudden, awarded the Victoria Cross for his 57th victory and the 250th victory of his squadron. He will die in 1918, crashing his aircraft on takeoff. Captain Mick Mannock, who swore revenge for the death of James McCudden. Once an outstanding tactician, blind hatred for his enemies leads him to chase his quarry down to make certain of victory. Inevitably, he is hit by ground fire. With 73 victories, Manick is awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. Billy Bishop, a Canadian, and one of the greatest aces of the First War. Bishop is a reckless loner, but nevertheless will survive with 72 victories. It is the French who coined the term ace to describe a pilot who has shot down five enemy aircraft. By the end of the Great War, many aces will have destroyed over 40 and a few over 70. But the most enduring contribution of the great aces will not be their individual victories. It will lie in the tactical knowledge they leave behind. It is the German ace Oswalda Bolker, who will, above all others, leave the greatest legacy. By 1916, Bolker has won over 40 victories, 20 in the space of two months. But far more significant, he is the first airman to study the tactics of aerial combat. Nineteen eighteen, the German armies starved of raw materials begin to crumble. Well-equipped Americans have joined the Allies in a series of major advances. The German defense is weary, and morale is on the point of collapse. Yet the German air service fights on. Now in command of the flying service until recently led by Richthofen is the young German ace, Captain Hermann Göring. Much decorated and with 20 victories to his credit, Göring will prove an able and decisive leader. By the closing weeks of the Great War, German losses of pilots and aircraft have been enormous. The strength of Göring's Richthofen group has been reduced from 50 pilots to 11. On the Allied side, cooperation between ground and air forces has dramatically improved. Telegraphic equipment is now installed in reconnaissance aircraft allowing squadrons of fighters to be diverted to deal with targets on the ground and in the air. And already, close cooperation between fighters and tanks has proved its worth. It is a powerful combination that will do much to force the final collapse of the German armies. November 1918, the end of the Great War. The victorious Allies impose harsh conditions on defeated and demoralized Germany. 
the intention is to ensure that Germany can never again go to war. The conditions of the Treaty of Versailles reduced the once mighty German army to a mere 100,000 men. The possession of an air force is forbidden. In the years following the Great War, flying and everything to do with flying grips the imagination of the world. The technical developments brought about by war are quickly adapted to civilian aircraft. Pilot veterans turn their skills to flying demonstrations and the pursuit of records. The lure of large sums in prize money produces a wave of attempts at setting new records for speed, altitude and endurance. In May 1919, two Englishmen, John Alcock and Arthur Brown, achieve what would have seemed impossible only a few years before, a non-stop flight across the Atlantic. The journey takes only 16 hours. A few months later, the world's first daily commercial air service begins, connecting London and Paris. Treat yourself to the best gift in history this holiday season. Enjoy unlimited access to award-winning podcasts and thousands of hours of original history documentaries released weekly exclusively on History Hit. There are topics for all history lovers, from Pompeii to D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description for an exclusive discount. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the past like never before with History Hit. In November 1923, an Italian, Francesco J. Penedo, flies from Italy to Australia and Tokyo, a distance of 33,000 miles. Although Germany is barred by the Treaty of Versailles from possessing an air force, she is allowed to develop and run a civil airline. The Lufthansa Company is formed in 1925. Lufthansa will be the training ground for a new generation of German fighter aces. In 1931, Adolf Gallant is accepted for pilot training with Lufthansa. Then, 19 years old, Gallant is destined to become one of the great fighter aces and leaders of the Second World War. Gallant and other new Lufthansa trainees are at once offered places on a secret training course for fighter pilots. All except. Soon the newcomers are transferred to Italy to train with Mussolini's Air Force. In the late 1920s and early 30s, Italian aviators are constantly in the news, capturing a string of speed and endurance records. The most famous Italian military aviator is Air Marshal Italo Balbo. On July the 1st, 1933, Balbo demonstrates to an astonished world that it is possible to fly a wing of 24 aircraft across the Atlantic in formation. Their arrival in the United States draws a crowd of one million spectators. Balbo's speciality is the coordination of complex air maneuvers. Many such maneuvers will in the future find their place in the formations of the British Air Force. During the Battle of Britain, the controversial big fighter wings, favored by some senior RAF commanders, will be known as Balbo's. Germany, 1934. Adolf Hitler arrives at the city of Nuremberg for a major rally of the party faithful. Nazi Germany is a little over one year old. Long before the formation of the first Nazi government in January 1933, the German national airline Lufthansa secretly supported Hitler. Aircraft for his election campaigns had been provided by Lufthansa free of charge. Now, with Germany firmly in the grip of the Nazis, the expansion of the infant and still secret German Air Force is placed high on the agenda. A secret air ministry is created, 
headed by the First World War fighter ace, Hermann Goering. Hitler's intention is to create an air force of over 4,000 planes, making it hazardous for any nation to risk attacking Germany. Founded in 1934, the new force is appropriately named the Risk Luftwaffe. The Risk Luftwaffe is to include 822 bombers and 250 fighters. Many are already obsolete. The Arado 65 and Heinkel 51 fighters are biplanes, at a time when the monoplane is fast becoming the norm. But Germany is in a hurry, and until better fighters can be produced, biplanes will have to suffice. Such an enormous build-up of air power can no longer be kept secret. On March the 9th, 1935, Germany announces to the world the existence of the Luftwaffe. One week later, Hitler rejects all the military restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles. By now, Adolf Gallant is an experienced fighter pilot with over 300 hours flying time and has just joined a new unit. The Richthofen Group, famous for its exploits in the Great War, has been reformed and is based near Berlin. The glory of the old days has not been forgotten and for Adolf Gallant, the legend of the long dead Red Baron has lost none of its magic. The coming months for Adolf Gallant and his fellow pilots of the Richthofen Group are a ceaseless round of intensive training. None can realize that their hard-won skills will soon be tested in combat. July 1936. Spain erupts in civil war. The great powers have agreed not to intervene, but Italy and Germany soon openly support Franco's rebel army, while the legal Republican government is backed by the Soviet Union. For the new Luftwaffe, it is the perfect opportunity to gain invaluable experience. The Luftwaffe contingent dispatched to Spain soon becomes a full-scale tactical air force. It is given the name the Condor Legion. The Condor Legion is equipped with bombers, fighters, ground attack and reconnaissance squadrons. It has its own anti-aircraft, communications and supply units. All are highly mobile. The chief of staff of the Condor Legion is Wolfram von Richthofen, the younger cousin of the famous First War Flyer. Von Richthofen, himself a veteran of the Great War and a fighter ace in his own right, is a dedicated exponent of close ground and air cooperation. More than anyone else, Richthofen will be responsible for establishing the Luftwaffe's place in the developing tactics of Blitzkrieg. In late 1937, Adolf Gallant is transferred to the Condor Legion. In Spain, he commands a ground attack unit of Heinkel 51 biplanes. In just over a year, Gallant flies 300 missions. His aircraft is damaged by ground fire, but he sees little aerial combat. By now, the real air fighting falls to a new German monoplane fighter, the Messerschmitt 109. In 1938, the 109 is armed with three 7.9 mm machine guns. Its 670 horsepower engine gives it a top speed of 300 miles per hour. The 109 will be the aircraft in which the greatest of the German fighter aces will win their reputations. In the summer of 1938, 
Adolf Gallant, now a squadron leader, completes his tour of duty in Spain. To his intense annoyance, he has just missed the arrival of the new 109s. Gallant hands over his command to one Werner Mulders, then 25 years old. Mulders, like Gallant, will become a legendary fighter race. Because the pilots of the Condor Legion are transferred to instructing after five victories, Mulders hides his kills from his superior officers. He will have won 14 victories before his deception is finally discovered. Germany's contribution to victory for Franco in the Spanish War will be richly rewarded. A series of valuable military lessons have been learned. Close cooperation between ground and air forces has been spectacularly successful. The merits of the Luftwaffe's aircraft have been evaluated in battlefield conditions, and Germany has gained over 200 experienced bomber and fighter crews. In the war soon to come, six pilots of the Condor Legion will become aces with over 100 kills. September the 1st, 1939. Blitzkrieg is unleashed on Poland. As the great masses of German armor begin to roll, the Luftwaffe strikes deep into the Polish heartland. The targets of the German bombers are airfields and industrial centers. Fighters cover the relentless advance of the armored columns. While Stuka dive bombers smash road and rail links, ground attack fighters, amongst them a unit led by Adolf Gallant, sweep the countryside, pouncing on anything that moves. Ground support operations commanded by Wolfram von Richthofen, ex-leader of the Condor Legion, are once more extraordinarily successful. Each time a German tank column meets Polish resistance, Richthofen applies the techniques he has developed in Spain. Almost from the first day of war, the Luftwaffe is free to roam the skies over Poland at will. The Polish Air Force has been dispersed to airfields all over the country in an attempt to save it from destruction. Many of these primitive airfields do not even possess a telephone. Without communications, the possibility of meeting the Luftwaffe in force has been lost. For Poland, the consequences will be fatal. The conquest of Poland with its one million strong army has taken only a month. It is the first time in history that an independent air force has played a decisive role in a ground campaign. Hermann Goering's air force has won a great triumph. It is clear that from now on, every major offensive undertaken by Germany will be spearheaded by the pilots of the Luftwaffe. While the German campaign in Poland was still unfolding, Hitler expressly forbade the Luftwaffe to attack targets in France. But on May the 10th, 1940, the order is given. Over 300 German bombers take to the air. Their objective is the destruction of 22 airfields in France, Belgium, and Holland. In one day, the Belgium and Dutch air forces are virtually destroyed. The French air force is badly damaged. The following day, it is the turn of the British airfields in France. By the evening of May the 11th, Luftwaffe intelligence estimates that 1,000 British and French aircraft have been destroyed. By May the 12th, 
RAF and French units in northern France have lost half of their bomber and fighter strength. The French reaction to the shock of sudden and heavy losses is to withdraw from their frontline airfields. With their aircraft scattered all over central France, any hope of containing the German armoured thrusts with concentrated air power is gone. As Blitzkrieg sweeps across the Low Countries and France, the fighter pilots of four nations are faced with an experienced and battle-hardened enemy. By now, Adolf Gallant is flying the Messerschmitt 109 he has coveted for so long. Yet when he shoots down three Belgian hurricanes, he is not much impressed by these his first victories. It has been too easy. Gallant writes, we outstrip them in speed, rate of climb, armament, and above all, in flying experience and training. The superiority of the Luftwaffe over the Allied air forces is due, above all, to the tactics of their fighter pilots. Werner Mulders has devised a new kind of fighting formation. The Luftwaffe call it the Swarm. The Swarm consists of two pairs of fighters flying in a finger four formation. Each pair is made up of a leader and his protecting wingman. While the swarm allows the maximum view of the sky above and to the rear, it can quickly break into fast and flexible pairs. In 10 days, swarms of 109s have destroyed 200 RAF fighters. On May the 20th, a wedge of German armor has reached the Channel coast of France. The British Expeditionary Force and the best divisions of the French army are encircled. In confusion, they retreat to the port of Dunkirk. The only hope is evacuation by sea. By May the 22nd, the German armor is moving on Dunkirk, preparing to destroy the trapped Allied divisions. But to the astonishment of the German generals, Hitler orders a halt. Conscious of the danger to his tanks posed by the Fen country around Dunkirk, Hitler accepts Goering's promise that the Luftwaffe can finish the job. The air assault on Dunkirk is to be made by a force of 300 bombers and 500 fighters. Each day begins with tactical reconnaissance aircraft searching out promising targets. Soon after, follow clouds of Stukas. Their objective is to destroy the ships of the British evacuation fleet. After the Stukas come the bombers and fighter bombers, while what few pauses there are in the aerial assault are filled by shell fire from German artillery. The Luftwaffe, although numerically powerful, is not faced with an easy task. Its pilots have been in action continuously for two weeks and its aircraft are badly in need of a refit. What is more, for the first time, the Luftwaffe is facing serious opposition in the air. The RAF has committed its best and newest fighter, the Spitfire, to the fight for Dunkirk. In spite of being able to spend only 15 minutes over the battle zone at combat speeds, Spitfires from bases in southern England soon inflict serious losses on the German bombers. However, against fighters, the British are faring badly. The standard RAF fighter unit is a tight Vic formation of three aircraft. Unlike the German swarm, which can easily break into two independent pairs, the Vic is extremely difficult to maneuver quickly. Inevitably, one fighter will become detached, 
an easy target for an enemy working in pairs. Werner Mulders, leading the swarm of 109s over Dunkirk, soon has the measure of RAF tactics. He quickly learns that the Spitfires, concentrating on maintaining their tight formations, are easily taken by surprise. Although RAF tactics are inadequate, Mulders discovers that individual British pilots can fight with skill and determination. The Spitfire is inferior to the 109 in both rate of climb and dive, but it can, as the German pilots find, turn on a Deutschmark. In close combat, the Spitfire is the superior fighter. On June the 1st, the Luftwaffe makes a final desperate attempt to halt the evacuation from Dunkirk. In one day, three ships are sunk and 11 badly damaged. Yet under constant attack, the Armada continues to shuttle across the channel. By June the 4th, the last day of the evacuation, 338,000 British and French soldiers have landed on English soil. And not only has Hermann Goering failed to destroy the British Expeditionary Force, but in the process, he has lost over 300 airmen. The surrender of the French armies and the signing of the armistice on June the 22nd, 1940, marks the end of the most spectacular campaign in military history. Now the commanders of the German armed forces reap their rewards. Despite Goering's failure to destroy the Allies at Dunkirk, he and his Luftwaffe are the heroes of Germany. Goering is made a Reich Marshal, the highest military rank created in German history. He is also awarded the Grand Cross of the Iron Cross, the Reich's highest decoration. Wolfram von Richthofen, the man responsible for the Luftwaffe's ground support operations, is awarded the Knight's Cross and made a General of Flyers. The Luftwaffe fighter aces get their share of the honors. Werner Mulders with 25 victories and Adolf Gallant with 17 are each awarded the Knight's Cross and promoted. The morale of the Luftwaffe is at the highest point in its history. The euphoria of the Luftwaffe is in stark contrast to the mood amongst the pilots and commanders of the RAF. Since the outbreak of war, over 1,000 British aircraft have been destroyed, half of them fighters. 435 pilots have been killed. With the death of so many, a wealth of experience has been irretrievably lost. The result is that on the eve of the Battle of Britain, RAF fighter tactics are as inadequate as they were on the first day of war. Within two weeks of the fall of France, German plans for the invasion of Britain are already being drafted. It is clear from the outset that success will depend on the Luftwaffe winning mastery of the skies above southern England. Hermann Goering calculates that four days of intensive air operations are all that are needed to destroy Britain's southern air defenses. A further four weeks will be required to destroy what remains of British air power. All along the Channel coast, the crack fighter squadrons of the Luftwaffe are gathering. Two full air fleets, with a third based in Denmark and Norway, can muster 2,800 combat aircraft. 
Eagle Day, scheduled for early August, is to herald the beginning of the Great Offensive. Five weeks later, the armored divisions will cross the Channel. Preparations for Eagle Day will take several weeks, but Goering decides that in the meantime, the Luftwaffe could profitably fight limited engagements. The purpose is to wear down RAF fighter strength. The bait which will draw the Royal Air Force to its destruction is to be a series of attacks on channel ports and convoys. It is the beginning of the Battle of Britain. The German raids on channel shipping are intended to be, above all, a contest between fighters. In an attempt to draw out the RAF in strength, formations of 300 bombers with strong fighter cover will make up to four raids a day on convoys passing through the Straits of Dover. The head of fighter command, Air Chief Marshal Dowding, has at his command only 600 modern fighters. But he does have one major asset, an asset whose potential the Luftwaffe has entirely failed to grasp, radar. No longer will it be necessary for British squadrons to patrol in search of the enemy, only to be low on fuel by the time a contact is made. For the pilots of the RAF, all flying will be flying to combat. While radar allows RAF controllers to see almost 120 miles, the pilots of the Luftwaffe are aware only of what they can see with their own eyes. Werner Mulders, flying daily 109 missions over the channel, is soon painfully aware that the Spitfires are striking with astonishing suddenness. He also realizes that the Stukas are proving far more vulnerable than anyone had foreseen. To withstand the forces created by its near vertical dive, the airframe of the Stuka must be exceptionally strong. The result is high weight and low speed. Soon the Stukas are suffering appalling losses in the one-sided contests RAF pilots call Stuka parties. For airmen of both sides, the prospect of being shot down over the channel is a daunting one. In response to mounting losses, the Luftwaffe takes action. An efficient sea rescue service is established to maximize the chances of survival for ditched pilots. German flyers are issued with yellow skull caps for visibility and are equipped with dinghies, marking dies and flares. Throughout each day, seaplanes and launches patrol off the French coast searching for the telltale flare or patch of colored dye. Early in the Battle of Britain, RAF commanders order that German rescue seaplanes, whether displaying a red cross or not, are to be shot down on sight. The reasoning is that a rescued pilot can be in action again within hours. Whatever chivalry had once existed between enemy airmen has disappeared forever. For the ditched British pilot, there is little hope of survival. Only 18 air-sea rescue launches patrol the entire south coast of England, and RAF pilots carry no signaling equipment or dinghies. For them, rescue depends above all on luck. Four weeks into the Luftwaffe's campaign, Goering's strategy of attrition is failing. Fighter Command is refusing to throw its aircraft into the battle in large numbers. 
Dowding is conserving his precious fighters, whatever the temptation. Although fighter command strategy will prove to be correct, its tactics and training are still a long way behind the Luftwaffe. By now, RAF training schools are so overstretched that they can teach pilots to fly, but have no time to teach them how to fight. Such tactical knowledge as the British fighter pilots do acquire is gleaned from anxious mess room discussions. How best to get on the tail of a 109, the merits of attacking from different directions, the vulnerability of the 109 to attacks from astern, and the cardinal rule is passed on to the newcomers, never fight alone. August the 13th, Eagle Day, the beginning of the great offensive intended to bring the RAF to its knees in four days. Every fighter command airfield between the Thames estuary and the Solent is targeted by the bombers and dive bombers of the Luftwaffe. Between August the 13th and August the 18th, 34 airfields and five radar stations will be attacked, some time and time again. The concentration of German raids on airfields and sector stations forces fighter command to make an unpalatable choice. Either scramble the fighters or lose them on the ground. As Goering's intended four-day assault turns into a protracted battle lasting many weeks, the beleaguered RAF still develops no clear tactical doctrine. Individual squadron commanders take the initiative and abandon the three-plane Vic formation. Some adopt the Finger 4 swarm of the Luftwaffe, but these are in the minority. Tactics, as one pilot remarks, appear to be the opinion of the senior officer present. As at Dunkirk, the lack of tactical sophistication does not prevent individual pilots with courage and flying skill taking a heavy toll of German bombers. Joseph Franticek will be the highest scoring RAF ace of the Battle of Britain. Trained in the Czech Air Force, Franticek fought in Poland and in France. A determined loner with little interest in tactics or discipline, he nevertheless destroys 17 German aircraft. Ginger Lacey, 23 years old and a veteran of the Battle for France, several times survives being shot down. In the Battle of Britain, he wins 15 victories. As August turns to September, the Royal Air Force, far from weakening, is inflicting heavier and heavier casualties on the Luftwaffe bombers. While the bombers sweep in for their attacks at between 11 and 18,000 feet, the practice of the escorting fighters is to fly 4,000 feet higher and a mile behind. British fighter pilots very soon learn to exploit the gap. Time and time again, they fall upon the bombers before the German fighters can intervene. The successes of the RAF against the German bombers will sow the seeds of a conflict within the Luftwaffe which will profoundly influence the outcome of the Battle of Britain. As bomber losses mount, bitterness about what the German bomber crew see as the failures of the fighter cover grows. In response to endless complaints, Goering orders the fighter escorts to fly close and level with the bombers rather than behind and several thousand feet above. The German fighter pilots are dismayed. Their maneuverability will be compromised and no longer will they enjoy the tactical advantage of superior height.
As the Luftwaffe widens its range of targets to include London and the major British cities, the problems in flying close escort to the bombers multiply. In attempting to get above city anti-aircraft defenses, the German bombers fly at great height, up to 22,000 feet. Seriously underpowered for such altitude and heavy with bombs, their speed is cut dramatically. Not only does fighter command have more time to react, but to stay with the bombers, the fast 109s must fly a weaving course. Once more, the bomber pilots complain to Goering that their escorts are leaving them to the mercy of the British. Goering's answer is to order an end to the fighter's weaving. What is more, he orders that escorts flying high and top cover should under no circumstances leave the bombers, even if they see British fighters in the distance. Adolf Gallant, Werner Mölders and other top German fighter pilots are enraged. They realize that their fighters can never operate effectively under such restrictions. The Spitfires, superior in the tight turns of close combat, will have every advantage. But Goering's orders must be obeyed. The cost will be the lives of many German fighter pilots. By November 1940, daylight raids on Britain have been virtually abandoned. Hitler has postponed indefinitely his plans for invasion. Instead, the morale of the British is to be broken by mass bombing under cover of darkness. Because night bombers need no escorts, the German fighter aces can, for a while at least, relax and enjoy the fame that their exploits have brought them. British fighter pilots have rarely approached the Luftwaffe's level of skill or the number of kills made by its aces. The war in Spain, in Poland and in France had produced for the Luftwaffe hundreds of battle-hardened veterans. Unlike the hastily trained pilots of the RAF, they have also had intensive and cautious instruction in the skills of air warfare. While the first combat missions of new Luftwaffe pilots has been restricted to nearby sorties, accompanied by an experienced leader, new RAF flyers have been thrown into the thick of battle. In spite of the German failure to win the Battle of Britain, the morale of the Luftwaffe fighter pilots is high. In their eyes, the conduct of the campaign has been Goering's responsibility. Their task had been simply to fight. They are in no doubt that they have acquitted themselves superbly. The highest scoring German ace of the Battle of Britain has been Helmut Wick, with 56 victories. Following Wick is his one-time teacher, Werner Mölders. Mölders has already made history by becoming the first pilot of the Second World War to score 20 kills. By the end of the Battle of Britain, he has won 54 victories. Adolf Gallant, Mölders' great rival in the contest to become the top ace of the Luftwaffe, has won 52 victories and has been promoted to commander of the 26th Fighter Wing. His best-known exploit is having been shot down twice in one day and lived. June 22, 1941, the first day of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. 
Once more, the offensive follows the classic pattern of blitzkrieg. In the opening phase of Barbarossa, over 1,000 Luftwaffe bombers and 920 fighters are unleashed against the ground and air forces of the Soviet Union. Facing the Luftwaffe is the most powerful air force in the world. Over 8,000 combat aircraft in 23 divisions. But despite intelligence warnings that invasion is imminent, the Red Air Force has failed to take defensive precautions. On the first day of the German offensive, 31 Soviet forward airfields are attacked. Over 1,400 aircraft are destroyed on the ground and 322 in the air. The cost of the Luftwaffe is only 36 aircraft. As the German air assault continues around the clock, it is plain that the ill-trained Soviet fighter pilots are no match for the veterans of the Luftwaffe. Nor does the Red Air Force possess a fighter which can meet the Messerschmitt 109 on equal terms. By the end of the first week of the campaign, over 4,000 Soviet aircraft have been destroyed for 179 German losses. Competition amongst the German fighter races to be the first to shoot down 100 aircraft grows intense. On July the 15th, 1941, the race is won. Werner Mulders achieves his 33rd victory in the Soviet Union and his 101st of the Second World War. To mark his success, Mulders is promoted to become Germany's first general of fighters. By November, he will be dead, killed in an air accident. His successor will be Adolf Gallant, now with over 80 victories. While the bulk of the Luftwaffe is committed to the gigantic battle for the conquest of the Soviet Union, many of its finest units are fighting in North Africa. Here, two Luftwaffe aces above all others will win for themselves lasting reputations. Hans Marseille, a veteran of the Battle of Britain, is renowned for being one of the best shots the Luftwaffe has ever produced, and the most elusive. He wins 150 victories without his own aircraft ever being hit by enemy fire. In September 1942, with 158 victories, Marseille is killed when the engine of his 109 bursts into flames and his parachute fails to open. The second great ace of the Luftwaffe's campaign in North Africa is Joachim Munchenberg. Having shot down his first enemy aircraft within weeks of the outbreak of war, Munchenberg had gone on to win 19 victories in the Battle of Malta. At the age of 23, with 103 victories, he is killed in a collision with an American Spitfire. By 1943, the tide of war is everywhere turning against Germany. The British have won a major victory at El Alamein and begun an offensive which will drive the Germans out of North Africa. In the Soviet Union, a revitalized Red Army has destroyed a 300,000 strong German army at Stalingrad. In the West, bombers of the RAF and the United States Army Air Force are bringing the war to the heart of Germany. Due to the lack of long-range fighter cover, RAF bombers have suffered heavy losses in their daylight raids over Germany. Night attacks are proving far less costly. The Luftwaffe knows that flak and searchlights can never defeat a determined night bombing offensive. The only hope is the development of a specialized force of night fighters. Like all other arms of the Luftwaffe, the night fighter units are designed for maximum flexibility. 
Fighter wings based as far afield as northern Denmark can be alerted, scrambled and intercept over Germany before landing at a nearby airfield to refuel and rearm. They can be back in action within 30 minutes. German air defenses have been strengthened enormously. New Liechtenstein radar sets can detect signals from the radars of British bombers. Single and twin-engine night fighter units, flak, communications, radar and control centers have been combined into regional divisions. Special monitoring posts have been established to listen for radio transmissions from enemy aircraft. During a raid, the Luftwaffe ground controllers, combining information from many sources, broadcast to their pilots a running commentary, directing them to the enemy. The result of these measures is a dramatic rise in British bomber casualties to 9%. Werner Streib, the leading German night fighter ace with over 60 victories, estimates that only 10% of the bombers he attacks even see his black fighter before they're struck by his cannon shells. The success of the Luftwaffe's night fighters will, for a time, force the Allies to restrict their raids to the margins of the Reich. But this is the last round of the air war that the Luftwaffe will ever win. Since 1942, four-engine flying fortresses of the United States Army Air Force have been playing an increasing role in Allied daylight bombing raids. The lack of an Allied fighter with the range to penetrate deep into Germany has forced an attempt to produce a bomber capable of defending itself. As the British have found before them, the Americans discover that unescorted daylight bombers, however heavily armed, are easy prey. But by the beginning of 1944, the deficiency has been remedied. American daylight raids can now be escorted by the new P-51 Mustang long-range fighter. Once their external fuel tanks have been jettisoned, the Mustangs can outturn and outdive the Messerschmitt 109 and the newer Fokker Wolf 190. For the first time in the Second World War, Luftwaffe fighter pilots cannot escape from danger with their famous tactic of the half roll and dive. The Mustangs can follow the German fighters and destroy them just above the ground. The German response to air raids is to draw away from the Eastern Front, the main strength of the Luftwaffe fighter arm. And this is at a time when every fighter is desperately needed in the East to counter Soviet offenses on an unprecedented scale. In the closing year of the war, the mortal struggle of the Luftwaffe in the East will produce the last and greatest of the fighter races of World War II. Eric Hartmann, 23 years old, will survive the war. He will have won more victories than any other fighter pilot in history. Hartmann's technique is to approach within 150 yards of his enemy before opening fire. It is an extraordinarily dangerous tactic. But by August 1944, Hartmann has won 301 victories. By January 1945, the Luftwaffe is in its death throes. Hermann Goering has by now tried the patience of his fighter pilots to the limit. Heaping insults upon even his finest aces, he reprimands them as cowards and malingerers. I have given you too many decorations, he complains. They've made you fat and lazy. Adolf Gallant, whom Goering knows to be critical of his leadership in the air war, is sacked from his post as inspector of fighters. For the last three months of the war, Gallant commands a squadron of Messerschmitt 262 jet fighters in what will become the Luftwaffe's last actions in the West. Adolf Gallant will survive the war.
On May the 8th, 1945, the day of Germany's surrender, Eric Hartmann shoots down a Soviet fighter for his 352nd kill. The ace of all aces is the last Luftwaffe pilot of World War II to claim a victory.